911. Where's your emergency? Well, I can't hear you. What address? 2012, a wave of excitement amongst the moviegoers at the Century 16 Theater in Colorado turned into horror when an unexpected assailant attacked them, unleashing a merciless hail of bullets within the dark auditorium. Um, get down and stay down. There's a man in the movie theater shooting people. You could hear the bullets hitting people. You could hear the screams and just, you know, it was just so surreal. As authorities race to comprehend the unfolding tragedy, a disturbing discovery looms in a nearby neighborhood. A potential new threat has been set up to claim even more innocent lives. Shockingly so, the details surrounding the calculated planning of these brutal attacks lie within the pages of a red book locked away in a university mailroom. What follows includes never-before-seen exclusive interviews with survivors, first responders, and family members affected by one of America's most horrific shootings. We will also hear from the killer himself and get a rare glimpse into the mind of a mass murderer. Late on a quiet Friday night, the Aurora Police Department is jolted by a distressing call. At 12.38 a.m., 911 emergency services receive a bone-chilling report about a shooter who had invaded the Century 16 Theater in Aurora, Colorado. After storming into one of the auditoriums, he'd started unleashing a volley of gunfire, plunging the theater into utter chaos and tragedy. In the wake of the initial distressing call, the operators at the 911 emergency services face an overwhelming influx of calls from terrified and injured moviegoers desperately seeking aid. The dispatchers make notes of the distraught individuals, offering reassurance as they wait for further assistance to arrive. Troubling reports of gunshot wounds start flooding in. Other callers pinpoint the exact location within the theater where the shooter had opened fire, which helps guide the swift response of police officers rushing to the scene. Hello, one where is your emergency? There's gunshots being fired in one of our auditoriums. Do you know if anybody's hurt? I don't know. There is a shooting in our theater right at Century 16 off of the table by the Aurora Mall. There is someone firing multiple shots. Multiple rounds of shots in our theater. Okay, we so they're inside. Okay, do you know what they're theater? Inside, they're in our theater. Help on the way. Listen to me. Do you know what theater they're inside? Theater 9. In a series of exclusive interviews with Iwu, several survivors provide insight into what transpired in Theater 9 on that night. We went inside the theater, of course, it was really busy. Uh, got into our seats. I remember, you know, we just had small talk was excited, you know, about being there, just really loud. And all of a sudden everybody was clapping and, you know, people in masks and costumes and stuff like that, just 
a lot of children, a lot of screens when the, you know, the previews came on. Many shared that the atmosphere inside the theater was filled with excitement and wonder for the new Batman movie. So I distinctly remember someone who was very excited, very loud. Uh, he was sitting like behind us to our left. He like stood up and clapped after some of the commercials. And I remember being like, oh man, like this is going to be so loud the whole movie. I remember these two little girls kept like running up all the stairs and running back down, right? Because we were waiting in this movie theater for you know, two and a half hours waiting for the movie to start. So we go to inside, kind of not too early to, I mean, to the front, not too far away. So kind of that in the middle. I remember on the right side of my son is a, a couple, a young couple, but uh, the guy is always sleep. His name is uh, John John Blanc. That's uh, on the right side of my son. So after my son is you, his mom, and then... After her is me. So we are sitting uh, around in the middle of the theater. The situation that time before start, there's a lot of people wearing uh, what we call that uniform, Batman, Catwoman, people are so excited. We got there early and I remember playing in the arcade with Veronica and everywhere you look like people were dressed up from head to toe in Batman costumes and Bane costumes, Catwoman, so on and so forth. And it was just a whole community event. Like it felt like all of the people there were there to have a good time. Like nobody was there with ill intentions. It, it just felt like a community and like this big Colorado family of people sharing the same passion for their favorite superhero. I wasn't all into that. I just thought it was so cool that I was 13 and I got to go to this midnight premiere. We played in the arcade for a little bit and then we ended up going um, just to sit down and wait. And I remember when we were sitting in our seats, there was a man who kept standing up like every hour or 30 minutes. I can't remember what it was, but he, he would be the time announcer for the whole theater. He would stand up and shout like, an hour left or 30 minutes left and then the whole theater would be like woo and clap and whatever and then you know about i would say about 10 to 15 minutes into the movie a cloud of smoke went across the bottom rows of the theater there and you know we're up here in those rows here and we're right in the middle so we can see everything and i looked at rebecca and i say man Someone's trying to ruin this movie. You got to remember, because it was so hot that summer, they didn't have fireworks. And so therefore, you know, I always thought because, you know, as a youngster, I played pranks with firebombs on buses and stuff, you know, not like that safe. But, you know, I kind of knew what it was. So I assumed it was a smoke bomb and it was a little kid doing it or some kid, you know, playing a prank because it's, you know, the Batman movie. When when the movie start, I think the commercial, I saw one person on the first row First row, but right side, in my right side. That one is already almost dark. That's because they are already, or almost starting the movie. And then this guy is uh, suddenly standing up and then throw away something far to my left side. Can you imagine that people is clapping? We thought that one is a uh, one of entertain before beginning of the movie. I remember it started with this canister launching from the right side of the theater all the way across like an upward diagonal angle to the left side of the theater. And I specifically remember it was like the whole theater, like everyone in the theater turned in unison, like almost as if we were like programmed to do it. Like we all turned at the same exact time to watch this thing fly across and land. I thought it was just like special effects, like someone, you know, dressed up, just having fun. But soon, a night of fun and entertainment turns into their biggest nightmare as they come to the grisly realization of what's happening. Went above our head and landed behind us in that corner where that really excitable, loud group was. Then people screamed and I just thought it was like a firework or something because then the boom started. And John knew immediately what it was and he pushed me down um, behind the seats in front of us and said, get down and stay down. I was naive. Like I was so young. In fact, I would say I was fearless, willing to try anything. And I was really outgoing and I wanted to meet everyone. So I like popped my head up over the seats and I was like, what? Why? Like, I didn't even know why we would be doing this. And he pushed me down further onto my belly and pushed me underneath the seats that we had been sitting on. So I was like really boxed in underneath the seats we were sitting on. And then like the 
you know, the stairs and the ground. And then he was on this side of me and he like gave me a final push and said, um, get down and stay down. There's a man in the movie theater shooting people. I was confused. Like it didn't sound like a good sound, but at this current time, I still thought it was all props. Like I thought it was some sort of gimmick for this midnight premiere that somebody thought would be fun. I start looking around and slowly kind of like lowering myself as I see people like start to panic. And then I turn to my cousin because I watch Ashley like basically jump on top of Veronica and drop to the floor. Kaylin is Jameson Toe's cousin and had joined him and his girlfriend, Ashley Moser, and her daughter, Veronica, that night. And I'm still confused. I have no idea, like, what's going on. And I turn to my cousin. And at the same time, he's standing up at this point. And as I look at him, he touches his forehead, like his temple, and he looks at his hand and there's blood dripping from his head. And we both realize at the same time that he has some sort of head injury, like there's blood coming from his head for some reason. And I think he realizes what's happening before I do, obviously, because he is older and has life experience. He then starts shouting at everybody to get down, like he's turning around to the row behind us, like telling everybody, get down, get down. Then that's when I drop to the floor. I don't, I don't, move until he tells me to move and then that's when I realized that it's something a little bit more serious and I look to my right and the friend that I brought with me she's still sitting in her chair so I grab her by her arm or her clothes and I pull her to the floor it's just chaos at this point there's just screaming and shouting and gunfire and I can't even hear myself think so my first instinct was to get on the ground and it's a good thing you know, Rebecca got down on the ground, too, but at the same time, she wasn't moving. And so there on the bottom of that seat with all the screens, the lights, the movie going, the smoke in the theater, um, it was like a war zone. And in the corner out of the crack of the seat, um, once I got enough courage to just lift my head up just a little bit, because um, you could hear the bullets sitting in the front of the seat. You could hear the bullets hitting people. You could hear the screams and just... You know, it was just so surreal. It was like a horror movie with a Viet, you know, a Vietnam, you know, Bush battle, you know, you know, and with wild movies playing, and you're right in the middle of it. You know, I really never described it that way, but that's pretty much what it felt like. Um, and then the sound, you know, the the boom, boom, boom. When I heard someone, uh, I got shot. He said, "This is a man." So I realized that one is uh, real. So I talked to my son, to my wife, ground to the floor. But the row is too small for us. You know, it's not good for for sitting. I said, mm-hmm. "Not sitting. We need to lay down." My son is really lay down, and then my wife too. And then uh, suddenly, I feel my eyes is uh, cut something, so I cannot see clear at that time. In an exclusive interview with Iwu, the retired commander from the Aurora Police Department and one of the first responders that night, Michael Daly, explains what happened after receiving the horrified calls. I was a lieutenant that night. I was in charge of our city SWAT team. I was also on duty running a unit called the uh, Summer Task Force. It was targeting crime in some of our older areas, our older neighborhoods. When the initial calls came out, we were working in a different district of the city. And uh, I think to a man, the the whole uh, Summer Task Force thought, oh, it's a shooting at the mall. District 2 can handle it. It sounds routine. We'll just kind of monitor. As the radio transmission started to pick up, it became apparent that there was an active shooting going on in the theater. They're still shooting? We've heard a couple more shots. Yes. Okay. Right away, it becomes surreal because police officers train for this. But when it comes to your town, it's like... Holy cow. I uh, responded to the scene. Uh, again, I can tell you, I, I jumped on Interstate 225 with my uh, police car going as fast as that car would go, maybe 110 miles an hour. It's an old horse. And I talk about this even today. I don't remember passing other cars on the highway. I mean, you you instantaneously become focused on, you know, where you're going and, and you're starting to think about what, you know, what you might have to do and stuff like that. So to this very day, in my mind, I, I know I was on the highway. I know I was driving very fast, but I don't even know if there were other cars out there with me. The current chief of the Aurora Police Department, Jad Lanigan, 
shares a similar experience from the night of the shooting in his exclusive interview. This, uh, I worked a swing shift at the time. It was three in the afternoon to three in the morning shift. I was the swing shift uh, probationary watch commander at the time. When it happened, of course, it was at midnight, 1230 in the morning. When it happened, it was just like any other night. It was very beautiful outside. We got up and went to work that day and it ended a, a much different way than we ever planned on. And that was the last thing he said to me. And I remember feeling like that final, like push of pressure before I didn't feel his hands anymore. And I remember like hearing like really deep, heavy breathing, but it was like rattly. And I didn't, I didn't put two and two together that that was John's breathing. And it was, it was three breaths. I distinctly remember it was three, like really rattled breaths. And then I didn't hear it anymore. And um, there was a lot of stimulus going on. There was like, I thought there was a waterfall above me. I mean, it was so much like, just like blood rushing down on me, like heavy Mm -hmm. waves, like so heavy, it would rush on my face. And then I was blinking it down my eyeballs. It felt like sometimes like gravel was being thrown at me. Like every once in a while, it would like hear this, feel this like small rocks, like hitting me. And, you know, I had my hands over my head. And I just kept thinking, like, this is it. This is the moment I die. This is the moment I die. When the officers arrive at the theater, the sight is nothing short of a horror movie. Arapaho 911, is this reference to shooting in Aurora? Yes, ma'am, and I got shot. I got hit. You were hit? I got hit. Yes, I got okay, hit. hold on a second. Head. Do not hang I up. I, my... Sir, do not hang yes, up. Ma'am. I need to bring Aurora on the phone, okay? Do not hang up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I got hit, there's yeah. something and I'm bleeding a lot. There is a lot of second minutes on the phone, okay, hold on just a second. Uh, get to the scene. I park on the side street, run up this small grassy berm, and I first encounter an officer that has an individual. He's shot on the ground. He's bleeding bad. The officer's asking for help. So I start helping him with the subject. I send another officer back from my patrol car. He actually drives it up over the grassy berm, and we load this, uh, I call him a kid. He was probably about 20 years old. Load him in the backseat of my car, and I tell the officer, get in with him, hang on, uh, we're taking off. Of course, I spot an ambulance, so I drive right to the ambulance. We drop that patient off, and then he and I go immediately to the front of the theater. There's already people streaming out. It's very chaotic to start. And and at this point, I still, like, I can't process what's going on. Like, I know that it's an active shooter, but that wasn't something that was as common back then as it is nowadays. It wasn't something that was my first thought, and it still didn't ever feel real. I just remember there were points in time where after we were on the floor, each of us were kind of popping up over the seats to see what we could see, what we could figure out, and if we could figure out exit strategy. And while all of that is happening, I can hear Veronica making these sounds that I've never heard a human make. They're the most comparable I could compare it to is like moans of pain. Like she, she wasn't saying words and she was just, it's very hard to describe because I've never heard a human being make it. I knew immediately by these sounds that something was wrong. And then I start to look at her and I see that there's blood like on her clothes and on her stomach. And so then I start shouting to her mom and my cousin, like, I think she's hurt. I think she's hurt. And I'm trying to talk to her and she's responding, but not with words. Like I I know she hears me, but all she could do is, is moan and reply. And I ask my friend to give me her phone because I don't know where any of my stuff is. My bag is somewhere in the mix and that's where my phone was. And so she hands me her phone and I proceed to call 911. When 911 answers, they tell me what my emergency is. Like they already know what's happening. They said, like, are you at the movie theater? And I said, we need help. We have a child. I think she's hurt. I think she's been shot. So 911, are you calling a report of crime in progress or a life-threatening emergency? Uh, there's, a, there's been a shooting. Uh, okay, is this a Century 16 sh- theater shooting? Yes. Do you know yes. anybody who's been shot? Yes, I do. Okay, yes. who's been shot? My two cousins. Okay, where are they right now? They're sitting on the floor of the school. Are they breathing or the conscious? They don't want to Ma'am, do you know if they're breathing and do you know if they're conscious? One of them is not breathing. Either one of them are breathing? One of them are breathing. And they are giving me these instructions to give her CPR. And moments before this happened, 
Ashley had picked up her head just to see what she could figure out. She dropped down like involuntarily. She, and she plopped down. She's still responsive at this time. And so I'm telling her like, Ashley, you need to move. I need to give her CPR. Push down his forehead and lift up under his chin until his head tilts back and the chin points up. I can't hear you. The movie is too loud. Okay, I need you to look into his mouth. Do you see anything in his mouth? Do I see anything on the ground? In his mouth. I can't hear you. I'm okay. so sorry. Okay, ma'am, that's okay. Can you put your ear to his mouth and see if he's breathing? Oh, um, he's not. I, I'm feeling on your chest and he's not. And Ashley's screaming at me that she can't move. She physically cannot move. And there's not enough space for us to move her without anyone else getting shot more than they've already been. So it was impossible for me to get to Veronica's chest because Mm -hmm. Ashley was laying on her. And I just kept screaming at the 911 operator, like, I can't get to her chest. I can't do it. Like, I can't reach her. Please help. I need you to start CPR on your cousin. Can you hear me? I can't. I will walk you through out. I will walk you through out and perform CPR. They have sent their help, and they can only do so much for me over the phone. And so I just remember passing the phone back to my friend because there was nothing more to be done. There's nobody here, ma'am. Oh, there's no gun. There's no gun. Ma'am. Can you hear me, ma'am? I mean, it was constant. It was fast. It was just. It was deafening almost. And so in, the, in that time span, like, you know, seconds had gone by, you know, time had gone by and you know, people were stepping on me to get over. And all of a sudden, like a voice in my head said, he's going to stop shooting. And when he does, you leave the theater. It's absolute mayhem with deafening gunshots coming from one of the auditoriums as people drag each other out to safety and injured victims cry for help. Uh, Of course, the suspect had dispersed gas inside the theater, like a uh, chemical agent that very similar to what the police use, tear gas and things like that. So immediately when you entered the building, you could smell it and then it starts to affect you. As they prepare to charge into the theater, the officers brace themselves for a potential shootout. However, the cloud of tear gas was severely hampering their vision and compromising their ability to respond effectively. as well. I start talking to my cousin about what we're going to do. Like, I I remember telling him we need to get out of here. His response to me was that Ashley couldn't move and I wasn't strong enough to help him carry her out. And even if we were to carry her out, he's still actively shooting. Like, we're not going to make it. I was just like, there is no way. And then almost five seconds later, true story, he stopped. I don't want to give away why the gun, why his gun stopped, but it stopped in a way that I knew it was time for me to get up and go. Um, I tried to get Rebecca up. She slumped back into the seat. I started moving towards the row and I got tripped over. At that time, I I heard shots fired. I was tumbling down the rows and made it through to the exit. And as I made it out the left side exit, um, I remember uh, seeing a person who was shot in the arm and uh, somebody just was trying to crawl to the exit. And it was just so surreal. I mean, to make it out of the theater and to get into the lobby, I felt like I, I, I achieved something. And then my son started complaining because uh, that guy is on the right side started to kicking him because uh, he, he's laid down too. I just saying that time I remember, forget it, my sign to get out from this building, I said. So this guy, after several times using the gun, he tried to changing the the second or reload. I don't know. So I can feel that one is. Uh, we have time to to get out from there. So I said to to my family, this is the time we go. So we tried to jumping, but uh, my son, of course, he's doing the first one because he's my on the right side. So he's going to another row behind, and then the shoe is off, and then he start complaining, my shoe, my shoe, no. Forget it with the shoe. Just get out. I said, go. So we start run from there. So my son, after that, my wife, and then me. When we start running, this is already, you know, run with uh, ice tear, you know, because it's hurting. And then we cannot 
breathing well, and then the floor is so slippery, even the carpet, yeah. but it's slippery. I'm just thinking that time, if uh, we can go together from the building safe, so we can go, if we die, die three people, I said like that. My wife is uh, going run, I don't know why, they're running to that guy, because this guy is not stay. he's moving mm-hmm. around, walking around. So for finally, my wife uh, realized this is the bad guy who's uh, holding the the long stick, but that one is Gando. So after after she realized that one is the bad guy, he's uh, asking us to to move uh, another way. So kind of uh, to stay away from that guy. So we're going to kind of the exit door. The one is close to the first time that guy is standing up. So in the front. Towards the front, near the screen. Uh, near the screen. We cannot see anything. So we, we're touching the wall to follow yeah. that and then the, the green exit. We can see that. And then until until the, the exit door, my wife is on the floor. She fell. She said, uh, I got I got shot. She said like that. I just go. And then she, <laughs> she tell me. Just go. You guys just go. Just leave me here. She said like that. So, you know, I'm sorry if uh, back to 2012, my emotional is coming back. In that door, it's not only us, though. I think it's uh, three or four people in the door, the, the exit door. So we, like, try who's going first, who's going first, because we doesn't know which one is bad guy, which one is a person watching movie. We doesn't know that. So I just grab my wife from the floor. I pull her to out of the door. And then my son is uh, helping a young young couple with a broken foot. Once the smoke clears out, the police are confronted with a heart-wrenching scene at the auditorium. The harrowing damage, the wounded and dead. When it finally stopped, there was a pause for a really long time. Like I waited to make sure that it wasn't like he was reloading or anything before I came up again. And... Mind you, for most of the shooting, the movie was still playing. It was playing during a shooting scene. There was that shooting and then the real shooting. And it took almost the whole active shooting time for them to even turn off the movie. So by the time he was done, the movie was off and the lights were coming on. And it was almost like simultaneously, like as the lights were coming on, my head was coming up and I could see this entire flood of police officers in like raid attire like they had the the shields and they were in like these big masks and these black suits and they were just very intimidating looking and as soon as I saw them like everyone that was still left in the theater just kept shouting from different places like from down below or far up like help us we have injured help us come help us and I don't know if it was because they were following protocol or if they couldn't hear us over there, but it was like they were moving in slow motion, like they were not coming to us fast enough. Um, When they finally reached our aisle, because we were like three rows up the stairs, they finally reached us and I was just screaming like, help us, We, we have a child, she's injured, help us, help us. And so they pulled me and my friend out first. And I remember when I was walking down the stairs, there was a body of a man kind of like laying at the bottom of the stairs. And I recognized him as the guy who was shouting the countdown. And I think he died trying to escape because he was above us. And when I saw him, he was below our row. And so I was barefoot, just walking through endless amounts of blood, trying to step over puddles that I could. And right before I went out the emergency exit, I turned around and I was watching Jameson and a police officer picking up Ashley by her hands and legs. And I I didn't see Veronica like I didn't know where she was. While one party continues to look for the shooter, another team of officers swiftly switch gears to extend medical aid to the critically wounded in an attempt to stabilize the dire situation. Team six, we got another person outside shot in the leg, a female. I got people running out of the theater, they're shot. Three eighteen, we also have another victim on the north side of this theater in the parking lot. Three or two, I got another male shot. I need rescue right in front of the theaters by dealers right off the main road. Cruiser 25, we need to break it up. Got two victims on the east side, north side of the theater. I need an ambulance here quick. We need rescue inside the auditorium, multiple victims. Lincoln 25, I need rescue to stage in the Dillard's lot. 
I need as many ambulances as we can to the Dillard's lot. There's team, I got seven down in the beat or not. Seven down. I've got a child victim. I need rescue at the back door of Theater 9 now. As the number of people in need of immediate medical help surpasses the capacity of available ambulances, the officers convert their vans into makeshift ambulances, doing everything within their power to speed up the transfer of wounded individuals to the hospital. Do I have permission to start taking some of these victims via, via car? I got a whole bunch of people shot out here, no rescue. Yes, yeah, load them up, get them in cars, get them out of here. Two, two, I'm taking one male to the hospital in my car. I notified rescue. Can you just let me know what hospitals you're taking them to so we can give them a heads up? Take 25, just notify all the other hospitals we got people coming in. Copy. Beneath all of the chaos laid another sense of urgency. Upon breaking into the auditorium, they'd noticed multiple firearms lying on the floor. It seemed unlikely for one person to carry it all and walk into the auditorium. The team suspects the presence of at least two shooters who might have escaped the scene by blending in with the frightened moviegoers. At this point, they decide to interview all the witnesses on site to get a picture of the incident. people and ask questions as to what they saw. Witnesses from Auditorium 8, the auditorium next to the shooting, recount a similar incident of an individual throwing a gas canister that caused coughing, irritation, and blurred vision among the audience. Some witnesses claimed to have seen the shooter and said that he was in regular clothes, while others said that he wore a costume. The team notifies all officers to be on the lookout for any suspicious-looking moviegoers. One of the shooters might be wearing a white and blue plaid shirt. Copy outstanding shooter possibly wearing a white and blue plaid shirt. In a race against time, those who aren't helping aid the wounded quickly start checking the CCTV footage from the theater. Just as the survivors and witnesses had informed them, the police noticed many moviegoers in costumes. Things seem to be moving smoothly until people start hearing the gunshots. As they diligently scrutinize the surveillance footage and comb through the mall, one officer notifies all parties with an update they've all been waiting for. Him. Sixteen Adam, I need a marked car behind the theater, stable side, the suspect in a gas mask. Fair nine, okay, and we need cars south side, suspect in a gas mask. Fair eleven, hold the air one second. Cars with that white car in the rear of the lot, is that a suspect? Yes, we've got rifles, gas masks. He's detained right now. I've got an open door going into the theater. Okay, hold that position. Hold your suspect. While combing through the mall, one of the officers stepped out from Auditorium 9's exit and noticed a trail of blood. He then caught sight of someone wearing what appeared to be police armor and a mask. However, unlike everyone else who was gripped by panic and horror, this individual remained remarkably composed. As soon as the officer approached, the individual instinctively raised his hands in the air seemingly cooperative. However, it was when the officer glanced at the man's car in the secluded parking lot that chills ran down his spine. Almost immediately, the individual admits to being the sole shooter. However, he then makes an even more shocking admission. He confesses to having arranged an explosive booby trap at his apartment, which was situated five minutes away from the theater. This terrifying revelation puts the lives of all apartment residents and the entire neighborhood at risk. In a whirlwind of urgency and concern, officers immediately take the man, 24-year-old James Holmes, into custody. Other officers are dispatched to his apartment. There, true to what he had declared, they uncover a harrowing booby trap arrangement that bears an eerie resemblance to a ticking time bomb set to unleash devastation upon anyone within its vicinity. The police swiftly evacuate the residents of James's apartment building and of the five other buildings in the surrounding area. To aid in their assessment of the perilous situation, they place a bomb robot inside the apartment to analyze the threat efficiently. Given the chaos in the vicinity and the number of people affected, the news of the incident starts trending on Twitter and media houses swarm the theater. Word of the attack spread rapidly throughout the country, prompting worried family members to rush to the scene in search of their loved ones. To assist them, the police establish a camp at a nearby high school where family members can receive information about their relatives. At the police station, James remains remarkably composed and unfazed by the gravity of his crimes and the lives he's taken. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm going to need you to not play with that. I know it's kind of weird wearing these on your hands, but uh, just bear with me. Just leave them on there. We'll get them off when we see the can, okay? Just Trust me. Of the... Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Just because of those things? And what, this thing? what things? What's this for? Huh? What's this we for? We just want to make sure that your hands are protected. They're protected? Yeah. Do you know what this is for? It's what they mask. Huh? It's what they mask. What do you think it's for? Popcorn. For popcorn? Yeah. Could be used for popcorn. But not right now. He's going to put that into the electric sock. In the interrogation, his answers continue to follow the same bizarre pattern. We're here to help you. Yeah. yeah, we're going to make this as easy as possible as we, as we can on you. Okay? And we have water coming. Yeah. Other than that, do you need anything? Oxygen. I'm going to read this to you. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay? The assigned the uh, victim services unit, children something. Uh-huh. What, what about that? There wasn't any children hurt. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll get to that. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Okay. For someone who showed no remorse for his actions, James seems to want the officers to know he claims to be concerned about any children. His strange behavior and demeanor raise numerous questions about what had led him to commit such a heinous attack. To unravel the mystery, investigators delve deep into his life conducting a comprehensive background investigation covering the months leading up to the incident. What they uncover is not at all what they expected. The other pertinent topic is microRNA. So what is microRNA? Well, microRNA is uh, roughly 22 nucleotides long. It turned out that James Holmes was a PhD student studying neuroscience at the University of Colorado. He called himself an aspiring scientist was an honor student and had applied for jobs working as a lab technician. James had only just started the PhD program, but if he'd completed it, he would have been a doctor of neuroscience and able to work as a professor or in a lab. His mentor, Professor Sukumar, speaks highly of his talent, but shares a few red flags about his behavior. He was very social. He never interacted with people. You know, he had some mannerisms that I, I was personally working on to get rid of. I mean, to alleviate from it. For example, in the seminar, he would have uh, you know, off-the-cuff remarks or you know, he would have these funny twitches kind of thing. And, and off-the-cuff as, as, as trying to be funny, kind okay. of thing, which, which people found was not very really appropriate. So I used to train him. When he had to give seminars, he would rehearse it with me and I used to go through all that you know, trying to mm -hmm. get him to stop doing that. And, and in the end, he was pretty improved. But so there were concerns socially, but... Uh, and, that was, and that was more, it sounds like, though, for his future and the profession he had chosen that, in yeah, terms of... Being, I mean, that being my job, that was one of the things. There were red flags in terms of you know, whether you'd be successful and with his kind of personality, kind of issues, but never any concerns that he's going to end up shooting people. Okay. Furthermore, this professor reveals that despite his high IQ at 123 and knack for science, James had failed an important exam. On June 7th, there was this preliminary exam that James didn't do well. And I think about June 8th or 9th, I talked to James and told him that we were planning to give him a remedial exam two to three weeks from that day and that he should talk to the examiners. I also told him at that time that you know, he should you know, think about whether this is the career he wants. And at that point, he told me that he had been thinking about it and he had decided to leave the program. So that was the last contact I had with James Holmes. I think it must have been a couple of days after June 7th. Let me, let me go to that contact. When you told James about that, was there any other conversation about why he wanted to quit the program? Was it specific no. to this oral exam? or It was specific to the oral exam. While the investigating team makes notes on James's behavior on campus and subsequent decision to leave the program, the FBI manages to get detailed information from James about the booby trap he had set up in his apartment. James, anything else you can think of? I put guys in that apartment that I need to be aware of. 
Did you cook up any explosives? Did you so you get all these in there, there's nothing that's gonna go boom? Oh that's those bullets can live better than I get. If I go walk in there, James, anything else you can think of, you know, what I have to be concerned about. Will the music still playing? Could be loud. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is there anything that passes your computer? Any wires or anything running to your computer? No, no. And the gasoline in the two liter bottles, that was going to be just... Was there any fuses going into that? I couldn't really see. Those were just to make fumes. So the fumes were once everything went? Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, the investigators at the university find out that James had been seeing a psychiatrist on campus. Furthermore, it comes to light that there had been significant tension and issues between James and the psychiatrist, leading to the involvement of the University of Colorado Police Department to investigate the situation. To find out more about the conflict, the investigators meet with the lead campus officer on the case. In this never-before-seen interview, the officer's chilling revelations expose the dark and ominous reality of James's thoughts. I guess what I'm saying is, what brought Holmes to your attention that you created that this create folder? Right. When I talked to you... Again, this was just a telephone call? It was that you, a telephone call. Was this at your office? It was at my office called me, and she said that she had been seeing a student who had failed an exam, and he had made comments to her, I want to kill as many people as possible. She said that she and Dr. who is her supervisor, were very concerned about this individual. So I asked her to give me as much information as she could on him. This so, is the second conversation now that you've had with her. Okay, but and so then whatever date, which we probably think now is the 11th, probably at 1322. Correct. Okay. So I told her that there's really nothing on him. We can find nothing on him. And she explained that he had come in voluntarily a couple months ago and that she thought he was psychotic or could be schizophrenic, that he was in the age group for a first break for schizophrenia. She said that he had expressed to her constant homicidal thoughts. I asked if he had a plan or target. She said no, no plan or specific targets, but he liked thinking about it. She said that she knew from seeing him that at least for a couple of years he had been teased and that he was in the neuroscience program for a year, um, that she felt that he was odd and awkward throughout the year, and that he seemed unconcerned about feedback that he would get from his instructors about his performance. He left in a huff, and that was in a meeting. That meeting, I have no idea when it took place. She said that he had refused antipsychotic drugs when she had offered them to him. Again, she didn't say when, so I have no information about that. Um, then she talked to me about the threats with the emoticons of him punching her in the face and giving her a black eye. She said at one time he said that is already scared of me and she has a bag behind the chair. I don't know who that was addressed to when he said that. The psychiatrist was so alarmed by the violent thoughts James had shared that she informed the authorities about his dangerous inclinations and his high potential to act on them. This doesn't break HIPAA, the federal law that restricts the sharing of sensitive patient information with third parties. Because if a patient is at risk of hurting themselves or others, it's not only negligence if it's not reported, but it's legally required to be reported. Anything else that she told you then during this? Yeah, I asked her if he had said, you know, how he was going to kill people. And she said he hasn't told anyone how he would kill and that he became interested in neuroscience to overcome biology. She didn't define overcome biology, so I don't know exactly what that meant. So she told me at that time that she was going to call his mom. When she called me back, she said she had talked to his mother and that that was pretty much his normal baseline behavior. I asked her a few more questions. I said, does he, does he have a support system here? She said, no, he has no family here. He's from San Diego. That he tends to be a loner and doesn't really have friends. He did tell her, I have $10,000 saved up and that will last a little while. My parents would help me. This was in response to him finding out he had failed his preliminary. Uh, he told her, I didn't like the program anyway. I'm going to drop out. Did she tell you anything else? She did. I, I asked her what she was doing from there, and she said she wasn't going to put him on a hold because he was borderline. 
However, despite the psychiatrist's ongoing concerns, the university's police department found no incriminating evidence against James or any cause to see his statements as intent to harm. Since he decided to drop out of the program and leave the university, the matter eventually faded away. The officer also reveals that she'd spoken with one of James's friends who shared some troubling text messages from James with her. So we went into a private room. Um, she identified herself as him and said that she didn't know if it had anything to do with anything, but she had gotten a text message on her phone. She'd been text messaging him as recently as June 9th is what she told me. And she showed me the text messages and I advised her to keep those text messages, to forward them to her email, not to delete them, but not to send them to me. As she showed me to them, I, would, I picked out some key things. And she was basically, she told me she was asking him, had contacted him to see how he was doing because she hadn't heard from him for a while. They were not intimate. They were not boyfriend-girlfriend. She had tried to befriend him. They had gone on a hike together at one time. And she was just trying to see, you know, how he was because she hadn't heard from him in a little while. And looking at those text messages, one of the things I noticed was that he said, I have dysphoric mania. And in another portion of that text message, he said, stay away from me on bad news. Dysphoric mania is an old term for bipolar disorder. The officer's reports detailing James's deteriorating mental health and disturbing preoccupation with violence prompt the investigators to examine his web search history. This information reveals a troubling array of maps to the Aurora Theater, and delving into explanations of numerous mental health conditions and philosophical theories, each one seemingly more troubling than the last. Further tracking of his credit cards showed that between May and July of 2012, James purchased firearms from a firearms dealer and picked up deliveries of ammunition from the FedEx Center. It appeared that James had meticulously orchestrated every aspect of the shooting and had conducted extensive research on the Century 16 Theater. After the FBI speaks with James about the explosives, the bomb squad reaches his apartment and detonates the booby trap via controlled blasts, ultimately saving several other lives that were threatened by his vicious plan. After eliminating the booby trap, police conduct a thorough search of his apartment and find a Batman mask and tickets to the show, among other pieces of evidence. While James's plans to shoot people at the theater find form in the evidence the investigators had gathered so far, his decision to set up an explosive booby trap at his apartment leaves everyone puzzled. Was it a sign that he intended to take his own life following the shooting? Or could it be part of an elaborate scheme they're yet to discover? In a series of interviews, a psychologist, Dr. William Reed, spent hours talking to James, discussing his thoughts and giving us a rare and chilling glimpse into the mind of a mass murderer. The following footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed professional counselor and a licensed clinical psychologist. During these interviews, he also reveals his true, twisted plan for the booby trap in his apartment. Did you ever test that stuff? No, I didn't get to test any of the incendiary devices. I was figuring they wouldn't work, and it was just made to look bomb-like. Like, that's really scary. But we have to divert attention to over here. There was, like, a small possibility that it would work. And so, so tell like, me. enough that they would be interested in stopping it. And what was your thought about a purpose, a reason that you would want them to be interested or something you would want them to do? to get them away from the theater, so kind of divert their forces over to the apartment. How were you planning to accomplish that? Through a noise complaint from the neighbors to bring them there. Okay. How was that set up? Uh, that was just set up to my computer where loud music would play after 15 minutes of silence. So it was like, there was just silence on the timer. And how did that work out in terms of attracting somebody to the sound? I think they made the complaint, but there wasn't a big response by the police, if there even was a response by the police. So a, a person would complain in the plan to the police, and the police would go to the apartment, bang on the door, open the door. Yeah, I left the door unlocked. As you were thinking about that, did you consider the possibility that 
a person might have come to the door, that is a non-police person, might have come to the door. Yeah, that's why when I sent a tripwire, I didn't have it attached to the door. I had it kind of inside. So they'd be able to see inside, but not go to like disable anything because there's an obstacle in the way. So if the person who opens the door could see what was there. Then they definitely call the police. They would call the cops. It occurs to me that the cops also would not, once they saw it, they wouldn't rush in either. James's affect is notably flat here. He's likely medicated, so it's hard to know if this is diagnostic-related or medication-related, as a number of antipsychotics can cause affect to be flattened. Regardless, it's quite eerie and showcases his lack of emotion. Although the bombs in James's apartment were put there to distract police and allow him more time to freely murder a large number of victims in the theater, he still informed police of the presence of the bombs after he was apprehended. James didn't have to make this confession, so it's possible that after the horrific massacre at the theater, he might have felt some level of regret. Regardless of James's plan and intentions, all of this shows his ability to think ahead and his advanced problem-solving abilities. We know that he's intelligent, but even individuals with high intelligence tend to be cognitively impaired when they're in the midst of a psychotic episode or a manic episode. It's difficult for them to focus, sustain attention, and follow through on even simple daily tasks, much less something as complex as planning and executing a murderous rampage of this magnitude. James might have had periods of psychosis and maybe mania too, but it's likely that when he committed the mass shooting, his thinking and other cognitive processes were intact. Still, even with these admissions, a crucial question lingered. Why? In a final shocker, investigators are notified by the authorities at Colorado University about a notebook lying in their Anschutz Medical Campus mailroom. James had mailed this notebook to his psychiatrist on July 19th, detailing his thoughts and plans during the weeks leading up to the crime. But the notebook was never delivered to her. Though this would have given her a heads up, James revealed that he knew she'd only received the book after he'd done the damage. Can you tell me why you created the notebook? To educate the psychiatrist so something like this wouldn't happen again. <coughs> Was there any other purpose to creating the notebook besides educating the psychiatrist? Well, if I died, it would have kind of told my story. This statement is an indication of the presence of an inflated sense of self-importance. This is a common thought process among individuals with severe antisocial personality disorder. They really believe that they are that important. In the book, James described his plans, his mental struggles, feelings, and his idea of seeing humans based on their worth in the context of their life. He added the most worth to children and believed they deserved a chance to live. This detail explained his concern for child victims during the shooting. What did you put together? Uh, that a child was killed the next day, I think. How did you react at that time when you put that together? That I tried to minimize child fatalities by choosing Midnight and PG-13. Once you learned that a child was killed, that you had killed a child. Uh, yeah, I was remorseful that I was sad that a child had died. Did you think much about it? Um, yeah. Do you still think much about it? I don't know how it could have been avoided, though, other than changing the plan to something else. If you had known that a child was going to be killed, would you have changed the plans, do you think? No, I think I would have still carried them out. If you had known that lots of children were going to be hurt, Dozens of children were going to be hurt. Then I'd have to change the plan to make it impersonal and not with children. And you're aware that dozens of children were? I'm not aware of that. I didn't know dozens of children were. His hesitation and his cop-out claiming he doesn't know how it could have been avoided indicates that James likely doesn't care about having killed a child. His supposed concern about children seems like it's just another aspect of his narcissism. He seems to want to act like he's a decent person because he's willing to spare children from his evil plan. Another indication of his grandiosity is how he has placed himself in a position of deciding who should live and who should die. A god complex. He's still trying to justify that he's innocent and has convinced himself that he did everything he could to prevent the child's death. 
Perhaps he's even blaming the parents of the child for allowing them to be at a late-night movie, as if they shouldn't have been there. It seems they were just collateral damage in James's mind. He didn't keep all of these disturbing details to himself, however. He first shared these thoughts with his girlfriend at the time via a Gmail chat. One message read, What I feel like doing is evil, so can't do that. On being asked what was the evil he wanted to do, James said, Kill people, of course. When his girlfriend had joked about being locked up after the act, James reasoned saying, That's why you kill many people. In his diary, he wrote about contemplating shooting people for a long time, but claimed he hadn't acted upon his thoughts until he believed his life was truly over. He stopped caring about the consequences after his girlfriend broke up with him in February 2012. At that time, were you still seeing? Or do you think you'd broken up by that time? Uh, the depression was after. At the deepest of the depressions, did you think about her? Uh, no. Any other time in the depression, did you think about? No. How about hurting or killing other people? Uh, yeah, I'd kind of transferred it into kind of homicidal, because like depression is normally, so I kind of transferred my thoughts into homicidal. Talk to me about the necessity of carrying out the shootings themselves after the preparation had done its job. Well, the shootings were supposed to increase my self-worth, so that would get me out of the depression in the end. The shootings were supposed to increase my self-worth. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I think it was in a text message I sent to about human capital, how you can kind of place a value on a life, and if you take lives away, that kind of adds to your own value. This is another disturbing indication of James's God complex. Only here, James is more specifically alluding to it. His abilities to decide who lives and dies and to have people at his mercy in such a horrific way gives him some sort of sick satisfaction a high that he can ride for a short time to derive some sort of relief from his misery. In addition, this is a completely chilling thought process of a genuine psychopath. This idea of adding value to your own life by taking others' lives. He's likely enjoying this back and forth with the psychologist, as it's all about James here, him in the inner workings of his mind. He's so full of himself that all of this digging into the what's and why's of the mass murder is allowing James to get more and more of that dopamine high by reliving it all. Is that an accurate rendition of the way you were feeling at that time? Or yeah. is, is there anything more to that that you can explain to me? Oh, I don't think there's anything else to it. That's a pretty concisely encapsulated theory, if you will. Okay. There's got to be more to it than that. Well, why is there got to be more? In what way did you think of taking other people's lives as enhancing yours? What, tell me about the logic of that. Just that anything they would have done or pursued gets canceled out and given to me. Starting today and looking back, does that still make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So the premise that you're describing two years ago, you would still... Agree with it. Uh, agree with that premise today? Yeah. Okay. Only a malignant psychopath would believe this. The psychologist is correct in the sense that it's not totally clear how ending a life adds to James's life in any way. But James seeing himself as gaining something by ending lives. The reality is that James is not being given anything tangible by the victims, of course. The only thing James gets is a fleeting feeling of power and control. His thirst for these things is so insatiable that he needs to go to this extreme level to feel them. It's often common among individuals with severe antisocial personality disorder to commit extreme acts of brutal violence because their threshold for feeling anything is so high. They often want to feel something and they know the only way to do it is by going to such extremes. Can you say any more about that? Just that the ultimate violence is death. We resort to killing when we can't solve a problem any other way. Sounds like that applies to politics and wars. And right, yeah. Does it apply to you? Uh, yeah. Tell me how it applies to you. Well, I couldn't solve the problem of getting out of my depression, so I thought I would make myself more valuable by killing people. And I think we talked about that 
being more valuable didn't mean you would live longer. No. Or that you would have more lives. Tell me again in what way you're more valuable. Well, it's kind of like the value of a dollar. A dollar isn't worth anything, but it, you attribute value to it. So if you attribute value to killing people, then it's, you become more valuable when you kill a person. And who does the attributing of the value? Uh, the killer. James reveals even more of his disturbing thoughts leading up to the crime during his discussions with Dr. Reed. Were there people over the last few months or so leading up to July 20th of 2012, people that you told you were angry? Oh, no, I never told anybody I was angry. Okay. I'm thinking of folks that you told or who at least got the impression that in some ways you had a hatred of mankind or were angry at um, mankind. I, I wrote hatred of mankind in the notebook. Okay. To you, does that translate to very angry or is that different from very angry? To me, the hatred's kind of like a hating broccoli or something, not a fiery, angry, passionate hate. It's kind of an aversive hate. Okay. Tell me about the hating broccoli kind of hate of mankind. Well, I just don't want to eat broccoli, so I kind of avoid it, be averse to it, instead of being like angry at broccoli, like chopping it up or something. Can you estimate what the earliest point was at which you began to think about these killings? Uh, when I bought the shotgun, I think. The shotgun. So that was the second gun that you purchased, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you remember roughly when the earliest point was that you ever thought about killing anybody? Um, teens, in the teens. Tell me about those thoughts, if you would. Uh, they would just pop up, and they were destructive thoughts towards others. It was kind of that in an abstract way. It wasn't actually visualizing killing or anything. It was just kind of like a voice saying, like, kill people. And then a voice voice that you could hear inside or outside your head or something else? Like your own voice, your own mind's voice. James's continued flat affect and limited show of emotion in not only his face but his tone of voice are often indications of severe mental illness such as psychosis. Flat affect can be associated with dysfunction in the amygdala, which is the part of the brain responsible for assigning emotional significance to events in a person's environment. Flat affect can also be associated with imbalances of brain chemicals like dopamine and serotonin, and may be related to his own biological imbalances, or even to heavy psychotropic medications he may be taking, which will affect his brain chemistry in a similar manner. In regards to his statements about broccoli, we don't see anger, because James basically compares his feelings toward mankind as being similar to how he feels about the vegetable. It seems like James not only has significant difficulty processing emotions, but his empathy is so absent that he doesn't feel anything for other human beings. That's why anger isn't even on his radar. People don't mean enough to him for him to even get to the point of bothering to feel anger. People are just a nuisance to him so his thoughts are of just exterminating them, almost like they were inanimate objects. Maybe at some point long ago, James did feel emotion for other people. Perhaps his emotions were so intense that he unconsciously shut them off. This theory may be true if James suffered some sort of childhood trauma, since people with severe mental illness often have trauma histories. How about the intrusive thoughts? Which intrusive thoughts? Ultimately, the gun... What were the intrusive thoughts about the guns? That I should shoot as many people as possible. How do you feel as you tell me that? Your voice dropped just a little bit. Uh, not good. Make you nervous to talk about it? Or uh, uh, what's, yeah. the fe- what's the feeling? Makes me nervous. Okay. I appreciate you talking about it. Okay. And I know it's inside. I know the thoughts have been there. They're not a secret between you and I. Dr. Reed appears to be answering some of the questions for James but this may be because this is a follow-up interview. It seems that James has previously provided some of the information, and the doctor may now be trying to differentiate his diagnosis by seeking clarification on some of his answers to decide what exactly is going on. As you were thinking about these things, buying a Glock, ordering a tear gas, are you angry, or what's the thought inside you at that time? Kind of that I have a mission to complete... That doesn't sound angry, but maybe it is. Is is angry in there anywhere? No, there's no anger. Just that it was something I had to do. 
Did the word mission come out of you or come from somewhere else? Uh, from me. Did the having to do it come from inside you or from somewhere else? Inside me. What do you make of that? What, what's the something you had to do? Uh, it's like I was obligated to do it. Around that time, did you have any picture in your mind of what you would look like using those weapons? Yes. When I took a picture of me holding the weapons, wearing the body armor, I don't know why I took them. I just took them just to be a record or something. What will people looking at those pictures think or see when they see those pictures? Uh, that I'm a killer, I guess. His drawings revealed he'd picked Auditorium 9 as his target given its size and because it had an exit that led to a sparsely used parking lot. Did you have a particular crowd in mind, a particular setting in mind at that time? No, not at that time. So going back now over two years, what do you think the crowd looked like? Where was it? What were they doing? What was going on? It was just a crowd. There wasn't any specific setting to it. Further interrogations with James helped the investigators understand the timeline of events from his perspective. On the night of the event, he dressed in regular clothes and reached the Century 16 Theater for a packed midnight show of the movie The Dark Knight Rises. He occupied a seat in the front row for Auditorium 9 and had walked out of the exit door half an hour into the movie, pretending to be on a call. He'd used a tablecloth holder to prop the door open, and then he walked up to his car in the parking lot. At what point did you call the behavioral health hotline or the hotline of some kind? Like halfway through gearing up. From the car then? Yeah, I called him, but I couldn't, I couldn't hear anybody on the other line. What led you to make that call? Just one last uh, chance to see if I should turn back or not. How big was the part of you that was hoping for that last chance? It was overruled by completing the... But how big was it to be overruled? Not very big. Enough to make you dial the phone? Yeah. What was your thought when the phone call ended? Uh, I'm really going to do this. Following this call, he put on a ballistic 3A jacket and an arm protector on one arm, a belt with ammunition, and a tactical vest. He also put on a gas mask and a helmet in addition to arming himself with multiple firearms. In some of the pictures the investigators eventually found on his iPhone, James's eyes looked bigger and solid black. He called those possessive lenses, a means to differentiate himself and become the James that wanted to kill and destroy. It was his way of dissociating himself from his actions. Are those contacts tinted a little red or are they black? They're solid black. They're they solid. Cover solid. the sclera black. How well can you see through those? Not at all because my... My normal contacts are prescription. Okay, how opaque are they or translucent or transparent? Oh, well, they have the hole where the retina is so you can see, but I can't see because it wasn't prescription contacts. Okay. There is a persistent but inaccurate rumor that he dressed as the Joker. He did not. Did the Batman story have anything to do with your choosing the Batman premiere or not? Uh, the main reason was because I knew it would be a blockbuster hit, so there'd be a lot of people there. There are other blockbuster hits. This is a really big blockbuster and fills the auditorium. Right. Do you think, in retrospect, that there was anything non-coincidental about your picking that blockbuster instead of Avatar or something? If it was, it was unconscious. You've tried to figure out unconscious things before. What do you think? That it bears some resemblance. Do you think the resemblance is coincidental? I'm not sure. <laughs> There's a similar selfie. That might be the one I'm thinking of. That's this one. You remember that one? Yep. Tell me about that one. Uh, What's that guy? It also looks devilish. Mm -hmm. Anything make it look additionally devilish to you? Uh, tongue sticking out. Okay. Do you remember what the words were about you? Usually, like, that's where the Joker is, that kind of thing. The Joker? Yeah. Any particular meaning to the word Joker? Um, in reference to Batman and Joker. How did they take up the word Joker in reference to Batman? Oh, well, they call me the Joker. Is that one of the ways that you're known at the jail as the Joker? Uh, yep. When did folks start calling you the Joker? Oh, I don't know, like shortly after. That sounds like an interesting nickname. Lots of people have nicknames in jail, I guess. 
While opening fire in the packed auditorium, James listened to loud techno music on his wireless headphones. He claimed he didn't want to hear the cries of his victims, so it wouldn't be personal. How about the sound? What did all that sound like? Well, I'd had my music in to drown out the sounds, and I guess I didn't hear much. How high was the music turned up? To its full volume. Full volume. So what could you hear besides the music? I don't remember hearing the gunshots. And you don't recall what the music was, but just that it was a Well, just that it was plain. And it was techno? Yeah. James even detailed his brutal attack to Dr. Reed. Apparently you didn't know or want to know any of the people in the theater. No, I kept it very impersonal. As you were carrying out the shootings, you were wearing gas masks the whole time? Uh, yes. How well could you see out of the mask? Not well, because there were lights behind the theater, which were actually brighter than in the theater. So I had to go from a brightly lit area to a darkly lit area. It had to have the gas mask with scratches in it. I tried to remove the scratches, but they weren't coming out. Was the movie still playing when you were shooting? Uh, yes. I wasn't watching it, though. I understand. Uh, Did that throw light on the audience that you were shooting at? Um, no. It threw light at the very front where there were no people sitting. James kept it very impersonal because, again, he thinks of humanity in the way he thinks of broccoli. However, the fact that he too measures to drown out the screams, cries, and gunshots could be because he knew that whatever ounce of humanity he has in him would likely be shaken by hearing the sounds of death and suffering all around him. Then you come around the curtain or around whatever the partition is and toss the canister? Yeah. Then I raised the shotgun and saw that people were getting up in like the back left corner. So I like shot up that direction. I don't remember any of the other shots of the shotgun. So you shot in that direction. Do you know whether you hit anything? I heard a scream. What happened next? And I shot all my shotgun rounds and tossed it on the floor. You shot how many times toward the folks on the upper left? I think the shotgun held five or six shells. So okay. I shot all six of them. Emptied in that, in that direction, okay. Then I uh, threw the gun down and switched to the AR-15. I don't remember where I shot those ones either, except for two people who tried to run away, and I shot like three shots at them. Right. Did their running away prompt you to shoot them? It made me kind of focus on them or divert my attention to them because I can't have everybody running away from the scene. You know, yeah. Tell me what, what you mean, I can't have everybody running away. Well, because then I'm kind of out of control of the situation. Did anybody get out while you were firing? Yeah, the two people who ran away, and then afterwards, four people, I think, carried a guy out, and they got out the back exit, the emergency exit. Tell me how you fire an AR with the gas mask on. Uh, you put it up to your shoulder and start sh shooting. Can you sight down the barrel with the gas mask on? I had a scope on it, but I didn't use it. So I just shot randomly. What do you see? Uh, bullets going towards seats. Are the bullets going toward anything else besides seats? Um, no. People? All the people are hiding behind the seats. About 65 or 70 of them obviously went toward people, didn't they? So, yeah, I assume it went through the seats and hit them. Really? Yeah. How many folks do you suppose were hit directly and how many of the bullets went through the seats and hit them? Maybe like four or five directly and then the rest were behind the seat hits. Really? Okay. But I... I can't remember seeing it. The shotgun? You were shooting BB shot? Yeah. You think that would go through a theater seat? I fired that one first. So mm -hmm. that was the four or five, which were kind of at people. Okay. The AR, the loads that you had, would they go through theater seats? I don't know. Those, I didn't test it. It would be pretty hard to test it. Did you plan for it to go through seats? I thought they would go through seats because they're rifle round. It's strange that James is claiming he shot at the seats rather than the people. This isn't at all consistent with his thinking in regards to increasing his own value by killing others. But the plan was that you would shoot them while they were running down the highway, or, or do I misunderstand? No, the plan was to contain them so they wouldn't start running, but I'd left that highway because I was kind of blocking the left aisleway and the emergency exit. 
So the only exit would be that <coughs> right aisle way. So why did you leave them that exit? Because it was far away from me, and they wouldn't attack me, come down and run and attack me. So the thought was they would go there rather than attack you? Right, they'd run away. Kind of a pressure valve, I guess. Yeah, a pressure release valve. Those that did run that way, did you shoot at them or no? Yeah. Hit some of them? No, I don't believe so. I think there were three shots, though, that (coughs) went through the wall and into Theater 8. Were you trying to? I didn't know it would do that. Were you trying to shoot them? Yes, I was aiming at them. Okay. Is there anything else about the experience inside the theater that sticks in your mind that you remember vividly? This one guy in the front row was smiling. I thought it was kind of odd that he'd be smiling. This was when I was going to leave going towards the exit and just looked back and saw that he was smiling. I think it's probably a stress reaction that he did. As far as you know, did he look alive? Yeah, he was alive and moving a little bit. As said earlier, the police found James by his car in the parking lot of the theater, but he shares an interesting detail about his thought process following the shooting with Dr. Reed. Why were you outside the theater and not inside the theater? I left the theater uh, at that point and went out the back. Had you finished or were you getting ready to go back in? No, at that point I just decided I was done. So it wasn't that they interrupted you? You had decided that you were done? No, I could have kept on shooting. Well, the magazine jammed, so my main weapon uh, malfunctioned. But you had three others. I had two others on me, and I would have had to reload the shotgun, which takes so much time. So essentially, I only had the one handgun. So if the cops hadn't come up to you, what would you have been doing? I would have driven away. That night, James Holmes killed 12 people and left 58 injured with gunshot wounds. Did you have any thoughts about the victims, the people that were shot, etc.? No, I just heard the numbers. It was like over 50 wounded and 12 died. What came to mind as you heard the numbers? It was new information. I didn't know that while I was in the theater. Any feelings come to mind? Any any pictures or feelings come to mind? Um, Just that I was worth 12 more people than I was before. Do the wounded count in your worth in that way of thinking about things, or no? I only count fatalities. During his imprisonment, James was put under psych evaluation following attempts to end his life. Though he pled guilty by cause of insanity, the court reasoned that he was struggling with severe mental health conditions, but was legally sane. They said you could recite the alphabet backwards. Oh, they asked me to uh, to do that again. Can you do it? Yeah. Z Y X O U V U T S R Q P on a J I H T O V D C B A. How did you pick that up? I got bored on a long car ride. Clearly, James has enjoyed the attention he's received during the course of his interviews. We've just witnessed one of the very few times he's exhibited any emotion during his sessions. James was found guilty on 24 counts of first degree murder, 140 counts of attempted first degree murder one count of possessing illegal explosives, and a sentence enhancement of a crime of violence. The jury ruled that James acted cruelly, was lying in wait, and ambushed his victims during the shooting, which constituted as aggravating factors. On August 26th, James Holmes was sentenced to 12 life imprisonment sentences without parole and a maximum of 3,318 additional years on attempted murder and explosives possession convictions after the jury failed to arrive at a conclusion about his death sentence. All right, why you kill the whole world was the delusion. Jonathan T. Blunk, age 26, Alexander J. Boyk, 18, Jesse Childress, 29, Gordon W. Cowden, 51, Jessica Gawi, 24, John Thomas Larimer, 27, Matthew McQuinn, 27, Michaela Medic, 23. Veronica Moser Sullivan, 6. Alex Sullivan, 27. Alexander Teves, 24. Rebecca Ann Wingo, 32. All died that night. At 6, Veronica was the youngest victim. I always think of Veronica that she's been a part of this whole healing process 
and bringing the Paper Queen Peace Project together, the memorial, everything, because she's in a different place now. And her childlike innocence, you know, children view the world with such innocence and hope and love and love everyone they meet. Like she made a friend of everyone she meets. And to me, the message is that's how we should all be all the time. Like children, you know, see the beauty in the world and see the beauty in others. Like she did, like all children do. So often, like when serendipities happen or someone mentions Veronica, I will text or call Ashley about it. And she loves hearing those stories. I have to say, Ashley, she is just even before this happened, she's just such a humble, sweet person. A mom like her would have a beautiful child like Ashley because Ashley's beautiful too. And Ashley's a fighter too. And it's like every time I hear her making progress, like she's going back to school again for the third time. I'm so, so proud of her for not giving up. Like when it first happened, I was just like, she is my hero just for getting out of bed in the morning. That's you right. know? After the trial on the very last day, I got to hug the shooter's parents. And that to me was a moment of like such forgiveness that now I don't hold a negative feeling. I just think it like helped me heal so much, but it's one of those moments where I just let love win. Like it's okay to recognize everybody lost in this situation. In the aftermath of the incident, the survivors started the 720 Foundation and gather in Aurora, Colorado every year for a vigil on the date that changed their lives forever. The memories of the deceased continue to linger on in the hearts of their families and communities. We would like to extend our utmost gratitude to all of those who spoke with us and shared their stories.